Actually, when we um, were discussing the topics for the school um, with David, uh, I thought that um, there are two very important aspects um, which I would like to include here and which are very vital for the region. And one is a uh, post-colonial context because uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union should be put up in a much wider context of uh, second half of the 20th century and the 21st century, the issue of decolonization. So not only decolonization as a uh, geographical concept, as a territorial concept, but also decolonization um, as an ideological concept, uh, decolonization of um, national mentality, decolonization of discourses, and very importantly, decolonization of memory. Because the second issue, which, uh, which is very vital for the school and uh, which I think will be touched upon uh, my friend Ivan Kurila, uh, and uh, which I think is uh, one of the key aspects of the international relations in the 21st century, uh, this is memory. Because a lot of international conflict, a lot of strife, a lot of ideological struggle goes these days around the issue of memory. Memory has suddenly turned out to be the carrier of identity, the carrier of conflict. People are ready to go to war for the issue of memory. And it is really very important to understand why memory has become so important for us, so vital for us. So um, these, two, these two issues in mind, decolonization and memory, uh, let me start this lecture, which I called uh, Russia's Memory Awards. And at this point, let me start the presentation. Right. Okay. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, one of the iconic uh, images of the memory war uh, go going on. Uh, and I'll be, of course, speaking a lot about the issue of Stalin. And I think also this will be important for our Georgian participants to understand um, the uh, image of Stalin. How is it important for identity, memory, and the international relations in the region? Uh, but um, let me start with some more general ob observations of how history has become um, a uh, minefield of uh, memories. Because really in 1991, as the Berlin Wall went down, as the Soviet Union break up, broke up, uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, has famously announced the end of history. But what followed instead was indeed not the end, but the return of history because history has become one of the most contested issues. Uh, and not only in international relations, I think uh, also on the everyday level, uh, every family, every person started looking for his or her roots. Uh, nations have started discovering themselves because I remember that the movement of uh, what we call in Russia reconstructory, reconstructors, historical reenactors also started in the 1990s. People dressing up in national costume and uh, period costumes uh, as, uh, I don't know, knights or uh, Soviet or Wehrmacht soldiers dressing up themselves, uh, reenacting battles. So this all started back in the 90s. Uh, also, um, uh, international on, on the national level, uh, um, states started uh, to rethink, uh, reconsider the official history narratives. Uh, building new memorial sites, uh, announcing new historical dates. Um, as with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, the issue of uh, restitution woke up, of course, uh, because the owners uh, of the previous uh, assets uh, that were confiscated uh, by the Soviet Union, um, they showed up and uh, well, like happened in the Baltic Republics. Of course, there was a lot of restitution of property, the old mansions, the old houses, the factories went to their owners uh, before 1939 and uh, so on. On the other hand, uh, many post-socialist nations underwent the process of lustration because people had to be responsible uh, for their crimes uh, committed during the communist regime. And uh, of course, this happened in a big way in Eastern Europe, uh, less so in the former Soviet Union. But this is also about the issue of memory because suddenly the 98 year old, year old, year old people had to uh, respond for something which they did uh, back in the 1940s, back in the 1950s. So um, this was also part of the great memorial turn 
in, um, in history. In many nations, uh, this was done on an institutional level. And I think uh, the case in point, a good case in point is uh, South Africa, uh, where they had uh, famously installed the truth commissions after the end of the apartheid. Uh, and uh, the several elections was brought to power the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela. There was a long and painful law uh, which stretched out for decades the process of national reconciliation uh, where people were sitting together at one table and, uh, you know, telling stories about the crimes of the apartheid. Uh, and uh, the witnesses uh, actually not, not, did not necessarily lead to the imprisonment of people, but uh, very often it led uh, to just, you know, atonement uh, to the pardon that many people were uh, excused after they have confessed uh, about the crimes which they have did, because very often the victims of these crimes only had to listen to the repentance of uh, the perpetrator. So uh, if you haven't... Uh, if you're not were not familiar with this, just make sure that you check out uh, at least uh, shortly with the truth commissions and the process of national reconciliation in South Africa, which I think was an outstanding uh, example of how memory can be put to work and uh, you know bring out a um, you know a more healthy society. Although of course uh, South Africa is still ways off uh, normalcy at this point. Um, so uh, summing up this introduction, I think that um, we have witnessed uh, several important trends. First, memory became an anchor of identity. The age of globalization, which came upon us uh, with you know, new technologies, the internet, the erasing of borders, uh, it made every nation look for its uh, origins, for its anchors of identity. And looking for identity, you inevitably found the issue of memory. So memory is one of these platforms and anchors of identity that help us uh, survive in the world of globalization. Secondly, memory has become an issue of protest and very often an issue of decolonization. Because as uh, the former colonies have been liberating, uh, they've uh, found uh, the points of resistance, their points of identity in uh, some kind of uh, historical memories. So memory is an important uh, part of decolonization process. And thirdly, and most uh, troublesome, memory has become a constructor of conflict. Because uh, you understand many conflicts are imagined, constructed, uh, made up by various elites. And it is very easy to use uh, sick memory, uh, to use um, memory uh, issues uh, for constructing uh, conflicts with your neighbors over contesting the memory of a certain event, contesting the memory of a certain past. So you see, in this sense, uh, memory has become a quintessential uh, law of uh, international relations. Uh, the famous uh, French historian, let's say the patriarch of memory studies, Pierre Nara, uh, in his book, um, he was, you know, famously uh, published his great uh, volume, uh, Les Lieux de Mémoire, The Places of Memory. So he's sort of the, about memorizing the past of France. And there he called um, the present age the global triumph of memory. He published this famous this article, uh, I think from 2000, and he called the new oncoming era the global triumph of memory. Um, interestingly, he connected this, he had a look, he looked for a sociological explanation for this because he was linking this to the rapid urbanization and the decline of the peasantry. At least it works so for France, because you see French memory is very much based in land, in the rural landscape. In agriculture. I think actually this could be quite also true of Georgia because uh, traditionally a uh, very uh, a country very much with roots in uh, in its soil in the countryside in the country produce. So the same happened in France in the 1950s and the 1960s there was a rapid disappearance of the French peasantry people were moving to cities and therefore he said people suddenly felt the void 
right? It's no longer were connected to your uh, territorial past, to your own region, to your own um, identity. And therefore you started looking for memory, for memorial sites, for memorizing. So this is uh, one of, uh, you know, the first uh, theoretical inputs on the issue of memory. Uh, here I would also quote um, the famous uh, British-Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, his book called uh, Retrotopia, which last year I think he died. Uh, the book, uh, his latest work called Retrotopia, uh, and uh, he writes about a kind of a policy making that uh, looks at the past. You try to build the future by looking at the past. A, or sort of rejecting utopia, but at the same time, you're uh, cherishing uh, the goods uh, which were delivered by utopia. So I think this very much fits into what we in Russia think about the Soviet Union or about our Russian past. I will say about this a few words a few minutes later, but generally um, it's about the uh, uh, um, adoration of the past, uh, glorification of the past, and uh, um, the lack of uh, mm, uh, the lack of imagination to live by the future. This is one of the key problems we face in Russia today: is uh, the lack of future, right, and the lack of uh, the ability to think about the future. Therefore, Russia lives by its past, it presently in this retrotopia described by Zygmunt Bauman. Um, uh, the third uh, theoretical input here and uh, another book which I um, recommend to read on the issue is Svetlana Boim. Uh, the, uh, this is the Soviet Russian uh, American uh, uh, Jewish uh, um, sociologist and anthropologist. Uh, and she had her latest book uh, called The Future of Nostalgia. And uh, once again, she talks about the same issue about this nostalgia for the past, which occur, as she says, each time after the revolution. And uh, then uh, she says about the construction of the pre-revolutionary past. She writes that not only does uh, ancien regime, the old regime lead to revolution, but the revolution constructs the old regime as a nostalgic memory. So to say we in the 1990s and the 2000s constructed the Soviet Union of our past, constructed the Soviet Union of our dreams as a nostalgia, not as some true memoir, but as a nostalgic memoir in which uh, it has become more, so to say, embellished. And finally, uh, I think um, the book to be read about memory is uh, Alida Asman, a uh, German uh, Jewish uh, sociologist, her famous book, Forgetting History, in which she writes about memorizing and forgetting. So forgetting is quite as important as uh, memorizing. And as, as we'll see later, many of our historical experiences are based on the art of forgetting as much as uh, it is based on the art of uh, memorizing. Like we in Russia are now trying to forget Gulag, to forget Stalinism. Uh, let me give a brief historical overview of uh, what had happened um, in the past decades. I think the first uh, memory conflict was as early as the 1990s, in the Balkan Wars. And uh, of course it had a territorial aspect, of course, of course it had a post-colonial aspect, the breakup of Yugoslavia, um, the sort of decolonizing from the Serbian uh, rule uh, for parts of Yugoslavia, of ex-Yugoslavia, but also it was a battle about the interpretation of memory of memorial events. For instance, the same famous battle of Kosovo Polje. Uh, in which Serbia lost its independence um, to the Ottoman Empire. So the way of memorizing Kosovo Polja really lay at the core of the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. Uh, 
what was it, right? The glorious um, expansion of the Ottoman Empire, forming a new state uh, in uh, the Western Balkans, or was it uh, the tragic event of the Serb history uh, and uh, you know losing the independence and uh, you know this famous Serbian legend of the girl of Kosovo Polja who is weeping, or looking for her loved ones among the killed bodies on the Kosovo Polja? Um, was it also the because of the location, the start of some, uh, you know, all Kosovo nation, Albanian nation, uh, because it was also it ha finds its territorial site on the on the Kosovo border. So you see this thing, this um, first images of memory and contested memory emerged as early as uh, thirty years ago, in the nineteen nineties. Uh, and if we look, uh, take a brief look over the continent, the European continent, we see, and also across the ocean, we see memorial issues coming up everywhere. Uh, for instance, one recent memory struggle uh, concerns Spain. Uh, those of you who have been to Spain, to Madrid, probably seen, been there, there's a famous uh, memorial to the uh, Civil War built uh, the, during the years of Franco's rule, uh, Valle de los Caídos, uh, the uh, Valley of the Fallen, uh, built for 20 years between 40 and uh, 58. And we're um, the Republicans and uh, the Falangistas are buried together. Uh, there was um, a, a huge grave uh, of uh, Franco, uh, there, uh, which was be become, you know, it was a shrine, basically, it's a temple. It's crowned by this, you know, 40, meter, 40 meters high cross. It's about 40 kilometers outside of Madrid, uh, this, uh, this site. So uh, there was, you know, thousands of thousands of pilgrims of fascists there celebrating the fascist past of uh, Spain, uh, the ultra-right, the fallen guests. Uh, and it was uh, since uh, the uh, you know departure of Franco in 1975, and since the um, several uh, socialist governments uh, that were in Spain, it was of course a very contested issue. And finally, um, one of the socialist governments by Felipe González, um, it um, accepted uh, a law of historical memory in which um, uh, the blame uh, was laid on the, um, on the fascists. Um, so yeah, just to go back, you have to understand that, that uh, a part of the historical pact uh, in, um, in Spain of reconciliation of the end of dictatorship uh, was uh, the act, uh, the pact of forgetting, Pacta del Olvido, so it was part of the negotiations that led to the end of the dictatorship, saying, okay, we just draw a line uh, below uh, history and say no more. We don't remember the crimes of the past. So we move of the future, we move to the future because we forget the crimes of the past. So Spain for several decades, for a couple of, for a whole generation indeed, was living under this pact of oblivion. So it's only in the 21st century that former memories came up uh, and became uh, important. And then uh, the law of historical memory was accepted in 2007. And then there was a decade of bitter uh, uh, infighting in Spain uh, between the socialists uh, and the Republicans uh, and the ultra-right. And finally, Franco's body uh, in October 2019 was uh, ejected from there and buried in his uh, family uh, cemetery. So uh, here you see this uh, exhumation of the body um, of General Franco. And still, I think the problem here that the civil war has not been really finished in Spain. The wounds of the civil war have not been uh, talk, uh, talked over uh, in school, uh, children uh, talk very little about the civil war, about the uh, Falangist terror, but also about the Republican terror, um, which was much smaller than the fascist terror, but still uh, there are some crimes uh, which have to be remembered. So, so uh, here we have uh, a successful democratic Western nation, but still tormented by the specters of the past, of the unspoken uh, past of the past which was forcefully forgotten 
and yet it came up in this you know body of Franco and still you know the country is shaken by um, uh, the various historical memories. Another example of um, historical memory strife is the United States and it's not only the Black Lives Matter movement of uh, the past year of uh, 2000 and 2001, but also uh, in the past, I would say 10 years, there have been a very serious uh, strife in the United States about, uh, the mon about the memory of the Civil War. Because once again, um, the uh, memory of the war has long been, um, for a long period has been erased and mythologized in the United States, right? After the end of the war, uh, there was a period of uh, reconstruction, as they saw, the integration of the defeated South in the uh, United States, right? Uh, the, um, uh, and at the time of reconstruction, uh, you know, the whole mythology of this noble defeated South was built, Right, uh, what should we know from you know Gone with the Wind uh, or the famous film by David Griffith, The Birth of a Nation, and so on. The whole mythology of the South was built on this glorious defeat by the you know noble generals of the war, and it somehow uh, totally obscured uh, the fact of uh, slavery, the fact of uh, you know oppressing of uh, the black population of the United States. So uh, it turned out that, uh, you know, many heroes of the South were indeed racists and uh, slave owners. Uh, and there was a uh, uh, movement uh, to deconstruct the monuments uh, to many heroes of the South here, like General Lee. He is an iconic person for the, uh, for the US South. And there were literally hundreds of monuments all over the South United States to General Lee. And already in the um, 2000s, uh, during Obama presidency, they started uh, deconstructing these monuments. And each time there was a clash, of course, with the local uh, conservative Confederate crowd. And this very much aggravated during the Trump presidency because the United States suddenly became a bitterly divided nation, divided over any political issue. And they started to be local clashes, which uh, once again, this was before the pandemic, which you could witness uh, you know, on TV every couple of weeks about you know, National Guard uh, you know, coming to another Southern city, uh, trying to you know, push away the demonstrators that were protecting uh, the monument uh, to the uh, to another president and uh, and uh, not to, to another general and so on. And you know, indeed, this reconsideration of American past, uh, it moved deeper and deeper because uh, suddenly it turned out that not only the Southern generals, but many characters uh, of American past uh, were indeed slave owners. And even people on the dollar bills, George Washington, Andrew Jackson, they were all slave owners. So should um, they be uh, reconsidered? So definitely I think the United States is moving towards the redesign of the dollar bills and uh, these presidents, even you know, such iconic figure as uh, Washington will disappear from the dollar bills because they do have a colonial past. They do have a slave owning past. And this is now a key issue for you know, the new American identity very much built around uh, the black issues and the issues of repentance and the reconciliation of um, the communities inside America. So in this sense, just like in Spain, in the um, United States, the problem is the unfinished civil war. Going back to Europe, uh, in, uh, it's another in historical, interesting historical episode on what they call the victimhood nationalism. Uh, the problem is that many East European nations uh, rightfully feel themselves and position themselves as double victims, victims of fascism and victims of communism. Like a typical East European nation has suffered at least twice in the past 
70, 80 years. And they were integrated into Europe uh, using this same very narrative. But then as sort of historical um, consciousness uh, was unraveling, uh, it came up that many East European nations indeed were participating in the crimes of the uh, fascist regime, in the crimes of the Holocaust. And uh, um, especially this concerns uh, the Poles, uh, the Lithuanians, and they were recorded um, instances, recorded cases of, uh, you know, Polish people uh, in the uh, village of Jedwabne uh, actively participating in killing all their Jews. And the same happened in the Lithuanian village of Molitai. Uh, and uh, these, uh, issues, these memorial issues were somewhat uncomfortable in the new public discourse. So when uh, various, let's say, memory warriors, be it Jewish or the local Poles and Lithuanians, um, they s felt uh, stigmatized and ostracized by the local population. So one example here is the famous movie uh, Poklosia, in Russian it was uh, Kalaski, uh, the, um, uh, by the um, uh, Polish film director Vladislav Pusikowski, which tells the story of the two brothers uh, living in America and they're coming back to their home village uh, in Poland. And um, they found some, you know, dark memory, uh, which is uh, haunting the entire village and the villagers don't talk about this. And then they start digging, they discover that during the war, all the Jewish population of uh, the village was killed or burned alive by the local villagers who wanted to grab their property, their homes. And as they discover the truth, they become the arch enemies of the villagers and eventually they're both killed by the villagers. So this was a movie which really shook Poland. Um, uh, and uh, there was a lot of protest. The movie, the film was banned because it said that, uh, you know, it uh, had um, <clears throat> blackened uh, the Polish people and the Polish history. The decision had to be taken at the highest level. The uh, film director was almost forced to emigrate from Poland for simply releasing this movie. So this gives a uh, um, uh, just interesting, uh, an interesting perspective on uh, this, um, contested memory of Eastern Europe. And the same case happened in Lithuania. There is a famous author, Ruta Vanagaite, and she was also discovering uh, the uh, uh, atrocities uh, done by the Lithuanian people against their own Jews, uh, together with the famous, I forgot his name, the Jewish uh, fact seeker, uh, who is uh, looking for, you know, like <clears throat> Holocaust, uh, uh, criminals um, you know, still alive in Eastern Europe. And um, she wrote this book, Svai, uh, Our People, uh, and she was once again became the arch enemy of the Lithuanian people. She had to basically hide and well, she, she wasn't really, you know, expelled from Lithuania, but she wasn't big, she had a big problem in, uh, in her own country. So these were two other examples of the victimhood nationalism and the contested memory of the Holocaust. Uh, now uh, to the decolonization narratives. Uh, for instance, the liberation, the so-called liberation of uh, uh, Europe, uh, of Eastern Europe uh, from fascists by the Soviet troops. So let's look at it from the point of view of Estonia. Were they liberated by the Red Army or were they colonized by the Red Army at the end of the Second World War? And how should the Estonians remember, uh, you know, honor these memorials to the Soviet soldier? The liberating soldier or the uh, colonizing soldier. So, and it was uh, forever a uh, problem for the new Estonian nation, the bronze soldier, which was standing in the center of Tallinn, built, of course, in the first years of the Soviet occupation, 1945 to 1947. 
And in the 90s, in the first years of Estonian independence, it became a Soviet symbol of Soviet occupation uh, and a symbol of resistance uh, on, on the one hand for the Estonian, but also this became a point of resistance for the Russian speaking minority in Estonia. Because for them, this was the anchor of their Soviet identity, of their Russian identity, and the point of resistance to oh, say Estonianization. So it was always a very hot issue in Tallinn and many Estonian cities. Uh, the fact uh, was this, um, uh, this um, the presence of the soldier. And there was the infamous uh, Bronze Night on the 26th, 27th April 2007, when the city council decided to remove, uh, uh, it wasn't destroyed actually, he was moved uh, to uh, was owners to the military cemetery in Tallinn, the soldier. But this um, caused a public outcry in, uh, in Russia, among the Russian speaking minorities in Estonia. There were riots in Tallinn and other Estonian cities. They were the first, uh, for the first time, uh, there was the cyber attacks from Russia. So this all started back in 2007. The Estonian government sites went down um, and uh, so on. There was a cyber war from Russia. So uh, now this is more or less uh, settled this issue. The soldier is peacefully standing on the military cemetery in Tallinn. But this for the first time showed uh, the issue of, um, you know, decolonization of Estonian memory and this neo-colonialism, memorial neo-colonialism of uh, uh, Russia. A much more contested issue, it was in Ukraine, the Lenin statues, uh, the famous uh, Lenina Pat, the fallen Lenins. Altogether, um, there was 5,000 monuments to Lenin uh, all over Ukraine. Uh, the first wave of the year, um, uh, toppling occurred uh, at the breakup of the Soviet Union and of course in West Ukraine, which was of course most uh, Europe oriented. So in 1991, uh, many of these Lenins were toppled. The second wave uh, occurred during the presidency of Viktor Yushchenko and his uh, decree on memorizing the victims of the Holodomor, of the famous Ukrainian famine caused by the Soviet leadership. Uh, the third wave uh, happened during the times of the um, Maidan, of the last Maidan, 2013-2014. Uh, the Maidan and then uh, the war on Ukraine, the annexation, Russian annexation of Crimea, and later occupation of Donbass. So during this time of, you know, the biggest wave of anti-Russian uh, uh, protests and uh, dismantling of Lenin's. So by 2021, by today, almost all of these monuments are destroyed. There's only like a handful of them remaining in some way in private gardens and, uh, you know, factories and so on. So we are the public does not have access. So um, the problem was uh, Lenin... Um, Monuments, obviously, I understand is um, the imperial breakup and the breakup of the Soviet and Russian Empire, and the decolonization and decommunization of Ukraine, the ongoing Russian Ukrainian war, and you, know, you see the Ukrainian identity, which only can be built uh, these days in the conditions of war on uh, de Russification, on uh, uh, parting ways with Russia on removing symbols of Russianness, of Sovietness, of Russianness, and of communism. You see, and Lenin embodies these three as being Soviet, as being, well, okay, not uh, ethnically Russian uh, completely, but, uh, you know, coming from the uh, uh, mainstream, the uh, great Russian, Velikarovsky, the great Russian discourse, and communist, one of the origins of the Soviet, uh, originators of the Soviet communism. Uh, inside Russia, too, um, the decolonization of memory is uh, quite important as well. For instance, uh, we have many historical figures who are uh, very um, questionable from the point of view of the colonized uh, nations of Russia, colonized peoples of Russia. Uh, one, for instance, um, is... Uh, uh, for instance, General Yermolov, right? The people of the Caucasus will certainly know the name. He is uh, the so-called Usmiritil Kavkaza, 
the pacifier of the Caucasus. And he is the, of course, the arch enemy of, of you know, of the Weinach people, of the of the Chechen people, of the many people of the of the North Caucasus. And there was a, a monument to him in uh, Mineralne Vody, and you see it uh, regularly is desecrated this monument because many of the mountain nations of the Caucasus uh, see him uh, as a colonizer, as a ruthless uh, killer who was burning, uh, you know, the entire Chechen villages uh, when people, you know, when hostages were taken and, you know, they are, and he had many famous quotations that, you know, Chechens are the meanest people of the world and they should be exterminated and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, they are recorded cases of genocide of uh, the Chechens and uh, of course uh, his monument uh, in Grozny was, um, destroyed it during the first days of the Chechen revolution in 1991. Um, uh, the same uh, with uh, General Suvorov, who is once again an iconic figure for uh, Russia, right? Uh, one of the key generals uh, that uh, are in the pantheon of the Russian military glory was uh, Georgi Zhukov, uh, Mikhail Kutuzov, and then, you know, Alexander Suvorov. We have orders uh, after their names. But then Suvorov also has his own, uh, you know, colonial history. Because uh, there are no guy people, uh, were, uh, he, was, he was just uh, presiding over the genocide of the Nogai people. And now many of uh, the Nagaitsi, uh, we call them in, um, in Russian, uh, they protest against the monuments to Suvorov, uh, and um, there is a big uh, uh, problem uh, with, you know, the Russian nationalists and uh, even the Moscow Central Party apparatus of uh, Yedina Russia Party and the local people uh, who have been, you know, dismantling the monuments to General Suvorov in Russia. Or finally, one of the founders of uh, the Russian state, Ivan the Terrible who is now very much celebrated in Russia. Well, as he was, of course, in the Stalin era. Well, well, to begin with, Ivan the Terrible is, of course, a very, um, Ivan Grozny uh, is a very contested figure. Uh, even in the imperial past, in the Russian imperial past, he wasn't really uh, put to the front. For instance, there is a famous monument in um, Novgorod to the, um, uh, 300 years of the Romanov dynasty. Uh, and um, uh, no, 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 sorry, the Tishilitia Russia, the thousand years of Russia. And uh, there was um, Ivan Grozny, which was erected in 1913. And uh, Ivan uh, the Terrible wasn't present on this monument. Uh, so even in the Imperial Russia, he was seen as a very obscure figure because of his atrocities, because of his aprichnina, uh, because of his, um, you know, the fact uh, that uh, Russia suffered greatly after his death uh, because he so much uh, raped the country uh, during the years of his rule uh, that the country was, you know, in troubles for almost a century after his departure. But now these days uh, in Russia, Grozny is seen as a great Tsar who has enlarged uh, the limits of the empire, who conquered, uh, you know, the Kazan Khanat, the Astrakhan Khanat um, uh, later on, and uh, expanded, which was, who was fighting uh, the West in the Livonian War in Latvia, in present day Latvia. So there are monuments erected to Grozny all over the place. But not, of course, in Kazan, because Kazan uh, is a place uh, which rejects the memory of Grozny. For them, Ivan the Terrible is uh, the uh, colonizer Tsar, the one who has ruined uh, the Tatar statehood, the one who has ruined the Tatar independence. Right? Because in the middle of the 16th century, uh, when Moscow took Kazan, when uh, Moscow started its imperial expansion, imperial expansion, uh, the uh, <clears throat> for for them this was a national tragedy, the end of the history of the independence and of the independent state. So there are many nationalists these days uh, in uh, Kazan that reject uh, the monuments to Grozny, 
uh, that rejected the names, the streets uh, named by uh, him. And indeed, they demand that the streets to the defenders of Kazan of the 16th century be named and so on. And they are like clashing with the authorities on some issues there. So generally, there is a problem of decolonizing the Russian empire because it's, uh, it itself, the Russia inside itself, is based on very um, contrasting memories of uh, the past between the colonizing state and the colonized uh, territories. Uh, now, uh, talking about the um, mm, way that historical memory is treated in Russia proper. Uh, the last 20 years, uh, the entire 21st century has been indeed um, the, uh, the time of um, the great memory project by Vladimir Putin and by his um, official uh, ideology. Uh, just one second, we will just start the... And uh, uh, by his official um, ideology. The memory project um, has uh, been promoted um, first and foremost by his culture minister and now his culture advisor, Vladimir Medinsky, who founded um, the rather infamous Russian Voyenno Historical Общество, Russian uh, Military Historical Society. Uh, so they have started a big crusade for um, rewriting. Uh, the national memory in Russia. So uh, these days, uh, our memory is very much nationalized, let's put it this way. It is taken away from the private uh, historians, uh, from the people seeking historical truths and uh, would, who would like to see the contrasting memories and also the memories of uh, defeating, of defeat and suffering. Right. So now the memory, the state memory project is streamlined. It's leading from victory to victory, from one uh, glorious Tsar to another glorious leader of the nation. Uh, the textbook teach us new patriotism in which Russia was always victorious. Victory has replaced memory. And um, in this streamlined historical narrative, we see the rehabilitation of uh, the most dubious figures of the past, including Ivan the Terrible, including Stalin. I will say a few words about Stalin later. And it uh, gives a very, um, let's say, idealized and indeed mythologized uh, picture of the past. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, it even um, falsifies history uh, to the liking of the state. Like take one uh, famous crime of the Soviet Union, which is the Katyn massacre of the Polish officer. When 35,000 Polish officers were killed uh, before the war, uh, they were interned and detained in 1931, uh, 39, and they were in 1940 before the war, they were killed um, by uh, the NKVD. And this, so this is very well documented, uh, this, um, this crime by the Soviet Union. And this is like a recognized genocide of the Poles. However, it's not recognized any longer in uh, today's Russia. It repeats the old historical lies which was perpetrated uh, back then at the Stalin period because there was a commission which falsified um, the testimony to the fact that um, so saying that it was not the Soviet uh, officers, but the Germans who have killed all these Poles. So, uh, and today's uh, Russian propaganda repeats this lies from the Stalin era that Soviet Union bears no responsibility for this tragedy. Or for instance, another interesting uh, historical fact which has been falsified, but which is part of the official memory. Uh, well, you're younger people in Georgia, but I think, um, you know, David also growing up in the Soviet Union would know the story of uh, the 28 Heroes Panfilovtsev, the 28 Panfilov heroes. Uh, this was the 28 infantrymen in the Battle of Moscow in December 1941 
which sacrificing their lives stop the onslaught of the German tank division. I don't remember, but it's like 28 people destroying something like 100 tanks uh, and stopping uh, the German tank offensive. And I, as a school kid, I grew up and there were streets named after them. There were, you know, monuments to them. But in fact, it is all a lie. It, it is all a nice story, which was invented by a military correspondent in January 1942, which was uh, you know, collecting very uh, strange evidence and he wrote up this beautiful story for the Krasnaya Zvezda, Red Star newspaper, and then it was served to the Soviet public. But there was already in 1946 an investigation by the military attorneys who found out that it is all a lie and the official documents on this, that all these, uh, like many of these 28 confil of heroes, they turned out to be alive and uh, pretty well after the war. Many of them were discovered in the four parts of the former Soviet Union. And this once again came to the surface now, recently, in recent years. And there was a director of the Russian uh, archive, of the Russian state archives that presented the facts, presented this investigation saying, look, friends, but this is this is all a lie. But then, you know, the state came up, the, the, cult, the culture minister came up and said, stop, no. This is a glorious myth, which has educated generations of people and it should be kept in the history books, despite the fact that this is a lie because it's a patriotic myth and this is important for the state and this is important for our historical memory. So it should be kept there. And this is amazing that on an official level, they have entered the falsification into a historical narrative of this 28 panfil of heroes. And we still have uh, uh, the streets uh, named after them, after this, you know, imaginary heroes. And we still have uh, the monuments dedicated to them. And this brings me to the key issue, which is the 9th of May, victory, which in today's uh, Russia has become a new religion. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we are a country living in the past because one of the greatest achievements that Putin did uh, was just robbing us of the future. Russia is a country which doesn't uh, think about future. In fact, I think this is a country which does not have a future at all in its current shape. We're living by the resources of the past. So, and the state propaganda has been very uh, skillfully orchestrating this, saying, so we are a country of the glorious past and uh, you know, our greatest diplomacy was in the past, uh, in the 19th century or in the 20th century. The greatest um, ambition, the greatest force of the Soviet Union was at this you know, height of the Stalin era in the late 1940s when the Soviet Union was controlling a large part of the world. And the Soviet Union was the best thing that happened to our history and the loss of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical history. So in a sense, Russia is a country deploring its great past, longing for its great past, a country of ressentiment, I would say. And in the past, there's one key event in which the country stood at the height of its this is 9th of May, 1940. And this is the true uh, point of reference in the history of a nation. If you ask me what is the real national holiday now, the um, day of the, uh, so to say, establishment of the Russian nation, this is, you know, not, of course, 1917, not 1991, uh, not some remote past in the Kiev Rus. No, it's 1945. That is when the present day Russian nation was born. And the entire country has the um, victory built into one uh, perpetuous religion. There's a liturgy of Pabeda, uh, of uh, victory, going on almost every day in the country, not only on, uh, not only on, the, <clears throat> um, on, the, uh, on the 9th of May, but on other days as well. So um, um, the, um, these rituals uh, include uh, the there's like, let's say, this uh, ritual processions with icons of uh, the people killed uh, during the war. 
the people wearing the special Georgievsky lente, St. George's ribbons, uh, uh, they will have this historical reenactments on the 9th of May, uh, when, you know, people dress up as military uniforms, you know, as it's on this picture, you see dress up as tanks, when uh, children are uh, dressed in military uniform, and so on. So um, 9th of May is a total paradigm uh, for Russia these days. And indeed it is so total that um, Russia sees its relations with the outside world as the reenactment of the battles of the World War II. For instance, Russia's war with Ukraine is seen as the continuation of 1945. Because we are the good guys and the Ukrainians are what? Fascists. Uh, like, like not we, but the official uh, propaganda discourse has called uh, the Kiev junta, the Kiev, uh, which uh, you know took power as a result of uh, the Maidan, and um, uh, we see the battles of the uh, Donbas, uh, the Donbas uh, fighters uh, against the Ukrainian army as the you know battle of the Soviet troops against uh, the fascist troops. And uh, indeed, uh, people in Donbas were using the same laws from 1940s. They were executing, for instance, uh, people using Stalin's orders. Can you imagine this? In 2014 and 2015, people were shot in the end on the orders from Stalin from 1942. The famous uh, Stalin's order, Nishago Nazat. Not a, not, a, not a step back. So this is what I call historical reconstruction. Or well, for instance, what they did in Donbas, they took a tank from the memorial, uh, the ES-1, Yosef Stalin-1 tank from the memorial. They put it back on the tracks, they installed the engine, they repaired its gun, and you know the fire that the Ukrainian from the tank, uh, which was there on the pedestal from uh, the 1940s. So, um, summing up uh, this uh, Russian victory, I have to say that uh, um, the generations of uh, Soviet people and Russian people were living under the dictum, under the dictum of uh, let there never be war. I, as a school boy, grew up in this, you know, in this uh, pacifist mentality, that war is such a uh, atrocity that it should never be repeated again, right? We were fighting for peace. But today's Russia, suddenly war is a very welcome development. If you come to Moscow, if you come to any Russian city these days, you will see thousands of cars with the bumper sticker, with a picture in the rear view window saying 1941, 1945, we can repeat it. And there is also a picture of the Sam Hickel uh, the hammer and sickle uh, raping the uh, literally raping uh, the German swastika, the fascist swastika. And then it says 1941, 1945, we can repeat it. And it doesn't really fit into my head. A nation which was saying, you know, no more war, as the Germans were saying after the war, nie wieder, never again, suddenly says, no, we can repeat it. In today's Russia, war has been replaced by victory. We don't, we think that, you know, there's a victory in the past, but we don't think about the war in the past. We think that there can be a victory without a war, right? And this is precisely what happens in today's Russia. Last year, they built this army temple, this humongous, uh, strangest uh, uh, memorial uh, Orthodox temple uh, in the military park. Uh, we have a military park, uh, theme park, Patriot, the Patriot Park uh, in Kubinka outside Moscow, where they have this, you know, big tank shows when you can, uh, you know, shooting ranges where there is the exhibition of military technology, tens of thousands of people visiting. That's part of this new militarist culture in Russia. And then they build this temple consecrated to the 75th anniversary of the victory. And it's really like, uh, apart from being, you know, strange and ugly, but it's also so symbolic. Um, for instance, in 25 meters tall to celebrate the fifth century of victory. Uh, for instance, the diameter of the dome is 
14.18 meters. And this because of the um, 1418 days of the war were lost in uh, these, these many days. And then many you know, figures and numbers that went into this temple. Uh, it's really amazing how sacral and symbolic uh, the Russian thinking on this has become. The steps to the, um, uh, the entry steps here um, to this uh, temple are made of metal from the German trophy weaponry. It was welded, uh, the, uh, the 1945 uh, weapons were welded to make steps in order to enter this temple. And before the opening, the press showed that there were mosaics of Stalin, of Putin, of uh, Minister of Defense Shoigu. Uh, they are uh, shown almost as saints there in the, in the temple. And I have to say there was a big public outcry and for the opening itself, uh, these mosaics were obscured. They were replaced by some more neutral ones. But it gives you the idea of this intense symbolic mentality there. Uh, so now I come to the uh, Stalinist, and uh, this is something also I think, uh, which will be very interesting to discuss with, um, with our Georgian students. Uh, the sort of the glorification of Stalin and uh, the um, how uh, the image of Stalin informs uh, the memory debates and why it has become so popular with the younger generation these days. In Russia too, there has been an amazing re-Stalinization of consciousness, re-Stalinization of mind. And uh, you know, you can ask uh, when uh, Gutkov uh, from Levada speaks, uh, they have been recording this, uh, you know, the changing attitude uh, to the figure of Stalin for 20 years now, how this has changed, and not than 20, but even 30 years all over the Soviet, post-Soviet period, how um, the Russian people have changed their attitude to Stalin. And of course, uh, at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and the 90s, uh, Stalin was certainly seen as a villain, uh, as a uh, killer, as a um, you know, head of the mass repression of, uh, of the people. But as uh, the 90s and then the 21st century moved on, uh, there was, you know, the figure, his um, importance has grown in the public, in the mass consciousness. Now he is one of the scene is is uh, one of the key leaders of the nation, uh, Stalin, uh, and uh, he for many Russians he represents a uh, quest for order. The pension age in Russia, the you know, product, uh, the prices for food uh, going up. So uh, the older generation would be saying something like this. On the other hand, uh, Stalin represents um, the, anti, the growing anti-liberal sentiment. So it's very um, fashionable in Russia sort of to scare the local liberals with the figure of Stalin and with the return of Stalin and saying that there was nothing wrong in repression and that the gulag was not such a bad thing. Uh, which recently was uh, also on the state um, airwaves, on the state propaganda, um, uh, talking uh, talking about <clears throat> uh, Gulag saying that, you know, it helped many people build a career in their lives, uh, the Gulag. Uh, there was an article a couple of years ago on the state media agency, uh, Ria Novosti. And generally speaking, I think the figure of Stalin is important in today's Russia as um, Mm, the sacred figure who is legitimizing the use of violence. There's so much violence in today's Russia in uh, relations uh, between the state and the citizen, a uh, violence in the street, a violence in Russia's relations with the outside world. That Stalin is a figure that legitimizes this violence. It gives us a, an aura of historic uh, legitimacy. Um, interestingly enough, um, Stalin is also seen as kind of a Russia's brand, uh, something, a message which is sent to the West, right? We can be, you know, a country which can produce an Oriental dictator, a nation dictator, and who can be a uh, threat to the um, a threat to the world. So we are a country which produces this kind of um, threats. 
And uh, this is, uh, since Russia these days is a country producing threats, right? It's one of the key experts of Russia to the world is not oil and gas, but fear. Stalin is an important figure for generating figure, the fear. And finally, I think uh, talking of the new generation, um, Stalin uh, is really has become some kind of a postmodern figure um, which uh, exists above historical memory. He's just, you know, a funny figure of the past, uh, sort of a chip in the game of the past. And for instance, as this on this t-shirt, uh, I can say, did you know Stalin was a hipster? And you know, there are barber shops in Moscow, which also have, um, you know, images of a young Stalin and saying, okay, we have the same, you know, kind of gibir, the same kind of a hair hat, uh, haircut. So, you know, come on in, you know, you can look as hip as, as a young Stalin. Uh, robbing the banks. So um, that's, um, you see, so uh, it's, uh, he is a figure um, from whom all the fear has been taken away and all the memorial context has been taken away and all the repression has been taken away. It's just turned into a, some kind of a, there is a, the Hinkali shop uh, named after Stalin. Uh, there could be a shish kebab shop named after Stalin. Of course, there's a public outcry each time and, you know, they are sometimes checked by the police. Um, they come, but, you know, they still appear every now and then. There is a scandal almost every month and some new outlet uh, which opens in Moscow, which bears the name of Stalin. So um, this here, I would really like um, once uh, once it's come to a close uh, to discuss it with uh, with our Georgian students how, how it is with in Georgia as well. Okay, coming to a close, I think I just uh, leave myself uh, with just a few remarks. Uh, so there is um, another contested memory is a dispute about the nineties. Um, uh, the uh, what was it? Russia, because officially in the official discourse and the discourse of Putin, um, this was a geopolitical catastrophe, the breakup of the Soviet Union and the 90s, 90s seen you know, as a time of trouble, smutne vreme. Uh, whereas for indeed uh, for many people like me and uh, many people of liberal persuasion and um, you know people who have founded their businesses, uh, it is then as a time of opportunity, time of renewal, and time of hope. This is precisely a time when Russia did have a future and was thinking about the future, right? So um, and there is a big historical debate going on in Russia about the uh, 1990s. And as it is, it was unraveling. I think we have discovered that Russia is such a embittered country that we have a no consensus inside our country about a single decade of the 20th century. We cannot agree on a single event in the history of the past century uh, in which, uh, let's say, the patriots and the liberals would agree. The 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s, Stalin's repression, the 1940s war, and so on and so on and so on. So every decade up to the last decade, the 1990s is a divisive issue. So Russia is a country profoundly uh, uncomfortable with its own past, split about every single element of its history, uh, which gives your uh, country profoundly hit by ressentiment, right? Uh, and uh, very, uh, schizophrenic, I would say, nation, nation schizophrenic about this past. Okay, in the last episode, I would like to quote uh, here um, before I come to some conclusions, uh, before I close this lecture, is the battles around uh, the victory day. Uh, because uh, the, not the victory day, but the 75th anniversary of the victory, um, which was uh, uh, last year, uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, so um, there was a big uh, battle, memory war with Europe concerning this. Um, uh, just ahead of this, in September 2019, the European Parliament passed a resolution on the importance of European remembrance in which it laid equal blame on the Soviet Union and on Germany for the start of World War II. And uh, this, you know, rose a huge campaign of opposition in Russia. 
in general today in Russia, comparing uh, Russia and Germany, uh, Soviet Union and Germany, Stalin and Hitler is criminally punishable. You can go to jail if you officially compare the atrocities of the um, of the Soviet Union uh, and of uh, the Nazi regime. So uh, this European resolution of the European Parliament really struck at the core of Russian uh, consciousness. And, um, you know, Russia retaliated with official resolutions. Putin himself, he wrote historical articles. Uh, he um, attacked uh, many of European nations on the count, especially Poles. Uh, his arch enemy is now Poland. He was making this um, famous anti-Polish remarks uh, about, uh, for instance, the Polish uh, wartime ambassador to Berlin, Józef Lipski. Uh, he called him the anti-Semitic swine, the anti-Semitic pig. Um, uh, so um, this was a big scandal. Uh, he was retorted by the <clears throat> uh, uh, by Morawiecki, uh, the Prime Minister uh, of Poland. Uh, so it was almost led to the breakup of a diplomatic relationship uh, between the two nations, the sort of this uh, contested debate about who is uh, responsible for the start of the Second World War. Because um, Europe and most importantly Poland say that uh, Russia, the Soviet Union bears equal responsibility by the start of for the start of the war, by signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and by being the ally with Hitler, and by you know dividing Poland in September 1939, uh, whereas uh, Russia says that no, Poland itself is responsible for the start of the war. It almost like invited the Germans on its territory, and uh, it wanted uh, you know its own territorial ambition. And uh, so um, there's a big debate with Poland about the start of the war. Uh, another um, big clash uh, and sudden arch enemy of Russia was the Czech Republic. It was quite unexpected. I didn't quite expect that Russia will find its arch enemy in the Czech Republic, but so it did. Uh, and in Prague uh, last year, they erected some memorials uh, which uh, were very questionable for Russia. On the one hand, they removed uh, the memorial to Marshal Ivan Konev uh, in Prague, uh, who was um, actually one of the liberators of Prague in May 1945, but also he was one of the commanders of the invading force who attacked uh, who invaded Prague in uh, August 1968, right? When the Prague Spring uh, was uh, just raised, uh, was suppressed by the Warsaw Pact uh, tanks. And so um, the Prague uh, City Council has removed the Marshal Konev statue last year from Prague. And of course, this was a huge public outcry in Moscow. And on the other occasion, in one of the Prague municipalities, they uh, put a very tiny memorial to the um, General Vlasov army. And the Vlasov army is uh, another very hot potato for, 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 for Russia because Vlasov is a um, collaborator of the Nazi, of the Germans. And for Russia today, he is a national traitor. But for Czechs, he was also one of the forces that, uh, because he later turned his arms against the Germans, and he was one of those who liberated Prague in uh, May 1945. And they've erected a small, tiny uh, tank the size of a matchbox, uh, this very, very tiny, funny postmodern memorial uh, to General Vlasov's army. But once again, in Russia, this was a huge, huge public outcry. And now the Czech Republic is seen as the one arch enemy of Russia. Russia officially has two um, unfriendly countries. One is the United States and the other is Czech Republic. So uh, this is uh, really funny how, uh, you know, these two came to the forefront in this Russian uh, memorial wars. And um, uh, finally, um, you know, all of these memorials, as these um, celebrations unraveled and uh, the official, the only military parade uh, uh, was not in 1940, in, 19, uh, in 2020, but this year. And uh, the final episode I can quite hear, I can quote here, is that Putin was uh, writing, uh, was reading his speech. Uh, uh, on the Red Square and the military parade, 9th of May, 
2021. And he made a famous, uh, not a slip of the tongue, but a change of the speech. Because in the official transcript of the speech on the Kremlin website, uh, it said, Sovietsky uh, народ был един which means in English, the Soviet people was united in fighting fascism. And Putin said instead, the Soviet uh, Sovietsky народ был один в борьбе с фашизмом. The Soviet Union was alone in fighting fascism. That's an amazing thing, as if there was no allies in the Second World War, right? Uh, there was no uh, United States, uh, no land lease, no United Kingdom, uh, no France. So the Soviet Union was the only country opposing fascism in the world. So this is a very interesting twist of this uh, historical debate going on in Russia today. Okay, I think I'll uh, to take in so, so much time. I'll skip this um, uh, penultimate slide. Uh, so uh, going to the, uh, to the conclusions, uh, I would say that memory, uh, once again, has become a very uh, uh, dangerous issue, as I call this, a minefield. Uh, because it comes, the memory sits at the nexus of security and identity. Mm. In my outlook on the world, I, uh, I'm a uh, constructivist. I'm a follower of the constructivist school of international relations. You probably have studied this all, that there is uh, realism, right? There's liberalism and there's constructivism. So I'm of a constructivist thing. And one of the key... Um, uh, ideas of constructivism is um, uh, the idea of societal security. And there's a quote from one of the founders of the Copenhagen School of International Relations, Uli Weber, who famously said, states have security, societies have identity, both usages imply survival. So you see, uh, people would go to war for identity as much as states would go to war for security because it implies the survival of a political community. So, and this is very important thing to be kept in mind, that memory is something for which you can go to war because it implies the survival, right? Uh, so um, looking back at the past 20 years, I see history and memory as a repoliticization of society. History has, removed, uh, has replaced ideology. In the past century, we were fighting for ideologies, communism versus liberalism, capitalism versus socialism, and so on. But now we are fighting not for ideologies, we're fighting for memories. We're fighting for the correct interpretation of the past. Look at the United States these days, at the BLM movement. It's, it's, it's once again, it's a fight, a civil war for memory, not for ideology. So, and this is very much a part of the emotional and moral politics of the 21st century. Because today's uh, policy is really not about um, rational calculation or resources. It's about emotions and it's about morality. So um, this is um, uh, a part of the moral turn and emotional turn uh, in the 21st century. Uh, obviously, memory is a platform for constructing uh, domestic and international politics. Uh, we see it in Russia these days, but we also see it in, you know, in the United States as uh, around the, the Black Lives Matter. Or, for instance, uh, you know, in Germany, we didn't talk uh, about Germany in memory politics, but this is a quintessential uh, example of a nation which built its entire domestic and foreign policy on the issue of memory, right? On separating yourself from the atrocities of fascism. And for instance, I can say that Germany became, uh, under Merkel, uh, Germany became one of the key recipients of uh, migrants from uh, the conflict in the Middle East, from Syria, because of its memory politics, because of its memory of fascism, because of a moral obligation to take responsibility for victims of the war. So therefore we have millions of Syrians coming to Germany because of German memory politics. So you see memory is really something in which domestic and foreign policy is, is based. 
Uh, and uh, bringing up the post-colonial context, um, we see that um, you know it's a minefield of memory. The entire post-Soviet space is a minefield of memory. Uh, and in this sense, the decolonization of our common memory is far from complete. If we look at the figures of Stalin, uh, Ivan Grozny, uh, Lenin, uh, as I mentioned, Marshal Zhukov, uh, Suvorov, I mean, any figure there is just a contested uh, issue there. So uh, the decolonization of memory in the former Soviet Union has, in the post Soviet space, has not yet started. And as for Russia, as my, for my own country, it's obviously instrumentalizing history and memory. It's part of its retropolitics as a conflict strategy in its war with the West. And it has, based on this memory, it has, uh, you know, found war as a main platform for its uh, relations with the outside world. Russia, unfortunately, these days sees its, itself as a nation at war, not a nation at peace. It's in a permanent war with the outside world. Uh, at this point, a hybrid war, an intelligence war, a special operations war, but um, I'm afraid that this is a country which is also preparing for hot war. I'm talking not about the people here, although there's a lot of militarism in our population, but of the Siloviki, of the security elite uh, that have grabbed the nation. But this, unfortunately, is also a part of this memory term, because Russian memory is a war memory. And therefore, Russian politics is a war politics, and Russian image of the future is the image of war. So, uh, uh, memory in this sense is a very um, dangerous issue, and it has to be treated as such. And I think we can uh, touch upon this issue in the discussions, and I hope we still have some time for this.